As you know, in an idealized discrete time system, the reading and writing happens at, you know, in synchrony at period uh, periodically. Um, but in a real system, it can kind of be a lot messier. If your control system is, if your controller is running on like a general purpose CPU on, on top of an operating system, you know, you're going to read and it's, that's going to take a certain amount of time and you may not know at precisely which time the sensor, me the sensor measurement was physically sampled. And then you'll run a control algorithm, um, but that control algorithm will take some time and it might get preempted. The operating system might put it to sleep so that it can go get some packets from the network or so that it can service some other high priority task. And then finally your control algorithm figures out what it wants to write, but it takes a little while for it to write to physically change the actuator, um, and you don't know where in this writing command that happens, and it might get preempted again. Anyway, and so by the time all these preemptions add up and computation times, you might get some timing error. It might not execute the way that you wanted. Um, so that's kind of a pain, and for that reason, um, this department has spent tons of money, well, not tons, but has spent a bunch of money. <laughs> <laughs> This, this department has, has invested in really high quality control products on the third floor with the inverted pendulum lab um, to hide from the students the fact that there are big troubles if you try to implement a control scheme on a, non, an, on a standard issue Linux machine. Um, so you, we use like the MATLAB, you know, real time workshop, or whatever they call it now. And, um, so there's, you know, this is a real pain in the neck and our students are lucky. They don't have to deal with this until they get the grasp um, of the normal control theory. Okay, so, so here's an example of things going wrong. Here's a motor. The motor is spinning. You can see it's trying to spin this gear here. Sorry, I'll stop poking at this thing you're trying to look at. And that gear is spinning um, a rotary encoder. That's the black thing up at the top. And it's trying to have the shaft angle of the rotary encoder just do this. It's going to go from 0 to 180, or minus 180 to positive 180, just back and forth, back and forth. Um, I guess it would go all the way around, minus 180, positive 180, and so on. And while this is happening, there are, this is time on the x-axis. The y-axis here is the shaft angle in degrees. And you can see that it's just trying to do a triangle wave here. But something happens that goes wrong. What goes wrong? Well, new high priority tasks are coming online and requiring the CPU from, from, the, uh, from our control task. So the operating system has to divert CPU resources to these new high priority tasks. And as a result, this is the time in between when the control task gets to run. It was designed, this is like some PID controller. The PID controller gains were chosen assuming that it gets to run every five milliseconds. But when these high priority tasks come in, you can see that sometimes it doesn't get to run. There's like 50 milliseconds in between when the uh, controller gets to run. So uh, it does very poorly. <laughs> um, it kind of goes crazy in here. And so the point of this slide is that large preemptions caused by the operating system preempting your, your control task result in poor control. So one reason that this could happen, for example, um, is, you know, uh, this, is, this controller is happening by uh, controlling a motor controller. So that motor controller has two inputs. It has a, uh, a pin that governs the, uh, the direction of the motor, either clockwise or counterclockwise, and that's controlled by the general purpose I.O. peripheral on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the computer. And it also has a motor speed input that you jiggle up and down with pulse, a pulse width modulated signal and the duty cycle of that PWM signal tells it essentially how fast to go. And so, it, you know, 50% means half, halfway to full throttle, 10% means uh, only 10% full throttle. And the point is, is that there is not an atomic operation in this system uh, that allows you to change the GPIO and the PWM at the same time. And that means that if you are writing a program, your controller at some point is going to have to say, okay, now please set the GPIO pins to one to make it go clockwise. And then please set the PWM to, you know, 10%. And if those two things don't happen pretty close together, you're going to have, you're going to switch, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to switch the direction of the motor without changing the speed the way that you thought. So that's an example where the hard, there are hardware limitations that prevent you from being able to control the system the way that you thought. And if you get preempted in between these two, um, that's good. you're gonna have a, a, a tough time. So what we're gonna um, tell you now is a, a controls framework that, can, uh, that, that will help, help to uh, alleviate these problems. But first I wanna tell you, what are some sources of timing uncertainty? There's a bunch of them. Um, if you have multiple processes running on a machine, the CPU has to be divided among them. You have to be able to serve all these different processes. So if you have one little computer that's trying to drive five different motors, um, all those five different motors are, have possibly different controllers and you gotta somehow share the CPU among them. 
You could have interrupts. You could have network packets coming in or file, system, file systems that need to be flushed to disk or something. You know, there's, there's a you know, management of the system that has to take place and you have to give the CPU when uh, sometimes there. There are system management interrupts, things like every now and then some low level piece of hardware will steal the CPU so that it can do a memory consistency check or it will do something like, you know, the CPU is too hot, I gotta turn on a fan or something. So there's some aspects of the system that you just really have no control over because you could destroy the hardware if you disable it. And, uh, and we'll ignore NUMA for now. The point is, is that if you are sharing a CPU, there is going to have to be some sort of sharing <laughs> that happens and that can lead to preemption. You, that is either going to be managed by the operating system, like Linux, with Linux's like, um, task scheduler, or you're going to have to worry about it. And if you worry about it, you could do something like accidentally disable all of the interrupts coming in for the network. And then you start dropping network packets because you disabled the network in, uh, interrupts so that your controller could run. So, there's, um, so it can be dangerous to do these things. So people have dealt with, people have tried to deal with this in a bunch of different ways. This Xenomai project is essentially a, um, it's a version of Linux that has an additional layer above the Linux kernel that can disable the Linux kernel and allow your controller to run, and then your controller will tell it to re-enable the Linux, I'm sorry, it doesn't dis disable the whole Linux kernel, it disables the, the, um, the task scheduler. Um, and so then you can have the task scheduler run normally again, and it can service all the interrupts. The real-time Linux kernel patches also, um, are a set of kernel patches that let you prioritize um, your control tasks or whatever process you want right up along the same level of, as like interrupts. So you can schedule, you can suddenly, it gives interrupts sort of a normal user space kind of priority so that you can compete with those interrupts. That also will give you a situation where you could potentially disable interrupts that are important for the system. There are real-time OSs like VxWorks and MicroCOS um, and uh, um, those are, those establish, um, nice like primitives for dealing with like semaphores and mutexes for dealing with shared resources between tasks and uh, give you primitives for like um, sleeping for a very precise amount of time. Um, so that can, that can be nice, that can be kind of a pain to, to set up. Um, and then in our Roseline project, actually we have some collaborators at UCLA who developed a bunch of kernel modules um, that um, expose to you, the controls programmer, um, a bunch of uh, timing primitives that allow you to schedule tasks at very precise times. Um, and also do clock synchronization across a network in case you're doing some sort of distributed control thing. So uh, there's been a bunch of prior work on essentially how you can share these resources in an effective way that vary from uh, you get full control over things and you can really break things to I'm using a tool that is uh, pretty safe and it just gives me, uh, it just exposes certain um, st data structures to me that I can use. Okay, so. Let me explain the, uh, the idea that we explored in, in this work. The idea was to use a thing called a real-time unit. <clears throat> you have the plant up here that you're trying to control, and you have a controller that's running on the non-real-time operating system. In between the two, let's put this thing called a real-time unit, which is running on some microcontroller, and it's a very small little program that is running, this microcontroller is not the sharing the CPU with the real-time, with the non-real-time operating system. It has its own, it has its own CPU, its own little memory. Um, it can run entirely independently, and it, it can obviously communicate with the with the main CPU and with the the plant. It can um, have control over the I/O so that it can um, affect the real world. The main idea is that the real, the RTU, the real-time unit, will sample the plant um, very periodically at very precise times. This this RTU is not doing anything besides just collecting samples from the plant. And, and, and actuating, it's given, we'll see in a second, it's given an actuation schedule of sort of time-stamped actuator values. And at that timestamp, the RTU will select that sample and write it out to the IO. So that's, uh, that's what the RTU is supposed to do. It buffers up these sensor values and ex executes out of a buffer the actuator values. And the controller then can collect all at once this asynchronous, asynchronously, whenever it gets a CPU, it will collect the sensor measurements, the timestamp sensor measurements from the RTU. It will, so this is like the timestamp and this is the sensor measurement. There's N, S of them. You get to decide um, how big, uh, how many sensor measurements are buffered. It will run some sort of control algorithm to produce a, another array of, act, of time stamped actuator values and it will deliver those to the RTU to um, deliver in case the controller gets put to sleep and pr or preempted by the operating system. So the main idea here, 
is that the controller, whenever it happens to get the CPU, whenever it happens to be able to run, can collect what it missed while it was sleeping, do some control, figure out what to do in the future, and give it to the RTU, hopefully all before it gets put to sleep again. And this would provide a way that the controller can still operate in the way that it's sort of expecting, even though it's in an, in an uncertain execution environment. That's the idea. So here's an example. Here's the, up at the top is the controller. It's running on a non-real-time operating system. It's doing the same stuff as before. It's reading and writing and running a control thing. Sometimes it's getting preempted, oh no. Here's the RTU running below it on a dedicated microcontroller. And it's the RTU that interfaces with the physical system. So for example, the controller sends an actuation schedule of maybe these five um, actuator values to be executed at time step two, three, four, five, and so on. Once the RTU gets this buffer, it will execute those, those um, actuator values at those times, even though the controller might be asleep or something. In the meantime, the RTU is also sampling at very precise times, that those purple circles. And when the controller calls read, it gets to collect all of the buffer, all the buffered sensor values that it missed, that, uh, that happened since the last time it called read. Then the controller gets to do the control, um, it might get preempted, and at the end of the day, it gets to, it has a new, it has computed a new vector of uh, actuator values to assign to the RTU. These are the green ones here. So it delivers them, and then, the, uh, and then the RTU takes it and runs with it. Notice in this baby diagram here, there are just a couple of read-writes that happen. There's these read-writes and this read-write. But there's seven time steps that happened in here if it were only up to the reading and the raw reading and writing, there would only be a couple of times where the controller got to go and gather a new a sensor measurement or give it or, or write an actuator value to the physical system. But because of this RTU, essentially every time step, the RTU is going to grab that measurement and provide an actuator value. And that's the key idea here, that by using these buffers, the... Uh, the controller can still, in a sense, be honored. It can still um, be able to do something, even if it's, uh, even if it's uh, you know, being preempted. Okay, so um, here's an example. We ran this on a, uh, on a BeagleBone. <clears throat> so BeagleBone here is a single board computer. It runs Debian Linux. Um, and the, the key defining thing that makes the BeagleBone really good for this is in addition to the main one gigahertz CPU that runs Linux, it has uh, two 200 megahertz CPUs that have their own instruction memory and their own data memory and their own ability to communicate with the I.O. Um, they can, they can, the, these little programmable real-time units are exactly what we need. They're, uh, they're a little microcontrollers that are on the same system on a chip as the one gigahertz CPU, and they can affect, and they can talk to the main CPU, they can affect the I.O., and they can run in parallel. Um, you have to write them in assembly code, but luckily, uh, so that's a huge pain, <laughs> but the, um, but the library, the thing that it has to do is just listen, you know, essentially get, get an actuation schedule and execute it and collect sensor measurements and deliver the sensor measurements. So it doesn't have to do some sort of fancy control algorithm. It just has to, it's just this intermediary layer that does good timekeeping. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the basic idea. So this is for the single input, single output system. So the sensor measurements are the shaft angle. The actuator values are the voltages that we're applying to the motor. So the controller gathers 32 of these previous um, sensor measurements, these previous sensor um, shaft angle measurements. Here they are going back in time before theta now. The controller then just does a very simple linear extrapolation of the sensor, of the sensor angle and then provides that future predicted sensor measurements to the PID controller. So this is just a simple PID controller. Here it is as like an, an IIR filter. And it provides all of these future thetas, these future shaft angle measurements, to the PID controller. That's the C here. And, the, <clears throat> and that produces a future actuation schedule. So it says, hey, based on the future sensor measurements that I expect that you will get, I would like you to now um, please actuate with these voltages. And then it takes those voltages, these red voltages here, the future actuator commands, and sends them to the RTU. So this is um, not very, this is a pretty rudimentary predictor. There are lots of ways that you could use some sort of internal model of the system to predict what you would expect future measurements to do. We'll talk about that later, future sensors. Uh, but this is just a, a simple sort of linear extrapolation. 
and it works um, pretty well. So here is the before and after, um, and you can see, so you've seen this picture before, the control system going crazy in the red, but when you use the programmable real-time unit on the BeagleBone as an RTU, as a real-time unit, and have it buffer these sensor measurements and these actuator things, you can see that it actually does a pretty good job of keeping the controller on track, even in the presence of huge preemptions, preemptions that are you know, up to 80 milliseconds. This thing was designed to run at fi every five milliseconds, and suddenly it's running at 50 or 80 milliseconds, like 10 times the sampling period it was expecting. It still does a good job. So we were pretty happy like, that, that even, this simple, um, even this simple idea um, could still result in um, pretty good benefits from um, the control performance. Let's talk a little bit about where this might go. Maybe one of my lab mates can, uh, can take it from here. But the, uh, but the basic idea of this real-time unit is really nicely suited for model predictive control. Um, you might know in model predictive control, the idea is that at every time step, you run an optimization problem. The optimization problem looks at the history of the previous actuator values that you applied to the system, looks at the previous sensor values that you measured, and, it's, and that optimization problem figures out what is the best possible sequence of future actuator values that I should apply in order to achieve some objective. The objectives typically make the state of the system follow some trajectory that you want. But it could be other things too, like follow that trajectory, but also try to uh, recover energy from some sort of uh, DC motor. I'll tell you, anyway, I'll tell you that in a second. But the basic idea is use the previous buffered values to predict a uh, and compute a future actuation schedule. And that's like precisely what this real-time unit um, could, uh, could do. So uh, I'm excited to see where that goes. We started looking in those directions a little bit, but it became pretty difficult to, um, to pick horizons, like a backwards horizon and a forward horizon, that would work in terms of how fast the BeagleBone could be able to solve them. So we looked a little bit in there and encountered some resistance, but uh, I leave it to you. We, um, one of the reasons that this would be cool is recovered energy can be a term in the MPC cost function. And so I made this janky flywheel with um, a motor that I borrowed from Paul Grit and one of these beagle bones. And, um, and we uh, made a little uh, video um, on YouTube uh, sort of describing <clears throat> describing the system and showing it in operation. Here's the little flywheel sort of running away. And, uh, and the idea is to be able to um, run the, the voltages that you're commanding <clears throat> through the motor driver to be able to suck energy back out of the flywheel. And it would be so cool to, um, to do that with model predictive control. Okay, the uh, mushy stuff. So it's been a real pleasure being a graduate student and Joao has been uh, very generous with his time and letting me explore all sorts of things that I was interested in. One of them was this um, certificate in college and university teaching, which um, is a little certificate that you can do um, that, that uh, if you really like teaching. And uh, you can experiment with different sort of methods of uh, pedagogy in the classroom, like using an eye clicker or using technology. You will get your, you will be critiqued, um, have your, your teaching methods uh, critiqued by someone from instructional development. We ran a couple of uh, outreach programs and, and uh, explored online teaching and learning, and eventually uh, and you designed a class, and um, I was instructor of record for, for Engineering 3 for, uh, over the summer. Uh, I also, uh, that also led to helping Jeff Mollis, Professor Jeff Mollis in the Mechanical Engineering Department, design uh, the College of Engineering's first online uh, class, fully online uh, class. So we had, um, we recorded Jeff, this is Lena Kim also from Summer Sessions. We recorded Jeff giving all these lectures in the uh, in Care Hall where there's this um, learning glass. They have this big glass and you write on it, um, you know, with a big, with a fancy marker. And then they flip it so that it looks normal to the kids. Um, and uh, the kids really ate it up. And we did that in summer 2016 and 2017. And uh, boy, it was great. We had students who were like taking their finals in like Israel and China, and they were able to still take this class without having to move to UCSB to be in summer sessions. These were all UCSB students, I should mention. They, they wanted to restrict the pilot program to, uh, to just people who were essentially paying tuition um, <laughs> before sort of releasing it to the world. So, um, so that was a lot of fun. 
And I also got to give a lot of talks um, of just about things that I was interested in. I got to talk about you know, the Kalman filter and some of the BeagleBone stuff I got to share with the IEEE club. Um, I got to teach the, um, the TA orientation, uh, sort of how to, how to teach an engineering classroom. So uh, yeah, more on that later. Um, and then uh, last summer I got to teach these, um, we had these like ECE tours where new ECE students come through and they get to see the labs and everything. And, and uh, we sort of got to show off the inverted pendulum setup. And this actually had um, sentimental value to me because when I met Joao in 2006, it was in his ECE 147C class, which has a lab inside right here. So this was a great like closure thing. I got to, you know, like inspire the next round of students um, in the same lab where Joao had inspired me. Oh, I was hoping, so. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, it's a bunch of engineers. Nobody's going to notice. <laughs> yeah, so four out of the nine, four out of the nine pictures I'm wearing, like, and this was not, the t-shirt is not acceptable for, for this presentation, so I was really backing myself into a corner. Thanks, Jason. So, <laughs> anyway, so if you want to see the extremely limited scope of my shirts, you can go to this website. <laughs> um, the other thing that happened was I got married. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, and my wonderful wife, Jen, um, did all of the food prep and especially tried the cookies. They're her literally award-winning um, caramel brown butter snickerdoodles. There, I got it right? Sort of. Yeah. Um, and Jen's been just totally awesome, very supportive. Uh, highly recommended uh, getting married. <laughs> 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 and... Um, so who knows what's next? Who knows what's next in the future? But I hope it'll involve a family, and uh, and this is uh, and maybe some sort of technical thing. This is uh, David's kid, um, Lydia, doing a robustness test on our Roombas. So uh, anyway, thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, Joao, for the nice graduate school career and my committee for uh, helping me out. That's it. Okay.